Okay, Taylor, ready when you are. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Um, I have a, a little a little context or background for me. This is this is my fifth or sixth year keeping bees. Um, I, for for several years before that, I, I would help out uh, with the hives of some friends or farmers that I worked for. But it, it wasn't until probably six years ago now that I got into it personally and got some hives myself. Um, never look back. It's it's endlessly fascinating. They're they're amazing creatures to observe and interact with. Um, and also, I really like honey, so it's it's a perk there. And, and of of course, everybody is especially fortunately in recent years. There's been a lot of popularity around the topic of saving bees and recognizing how crucial they are in our food system, uh, particularly in their role as pollinators. And it is the case that the vast majority of our food is pollinated by bees, um, not just honeybees. Uh, there are there are hundreds and hundreds of native species of bee in the U.S. Uh, the, fir the first fun fact we'll learn is that the common honeybee that everybody thinks of, um, uh, known as the Western honeybee, the species name being Apis mellifera or mellifera, is not a native species. Um, I mean, at this point, I'd say it's it's naturalized in that there are there are thousands and thousands of hives being kept throughout the U.S. Many of them uh, leave or abscond from the boxes people are putting them in. And, they found their way into the wild. There's plenty of wild uh, Western honeybee hives that live in the hollows of trees or under the siding of somebody's house. Um, so while they're not originally native, they're they're a permanent resident here in the U.S. at this point. Um, but it's always important, especially just when we're talking about the importance of bees as pollinators and protecting them, that we recognize those many other species. Um, according to the the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, I believe, on their website, they list right around 400 species of bee. Uh, that includes a lot of different types of bees, the, the, the tiny ones like the leaf miners, um, or I'm sorry, the leaf cutters and the minor bees, and then lots of the big types of bumblebees, the carpenter bees, the mason bees. Um, but there's many, many of them out there, and they do a massive countless um, immeasurable amount of work in terms of not just pollinating our food, but pollinating every single flower that you see, every wildflower, everything that you grow in your garden and you hope that it'll get pollinated and it'll go to seed, all thanks to, for the most part, insects and for the most part, bees. Um, so, so it's crucial that we continue to educate ourselves about them and support them in whatever ways we can. Um, particularly because we work with them so much and particularly because we like honey. Honeybees tend to become the poster child for this sort of campaign. Um, so, you know, it's, it's important that we recognize all the species, but basically uh, any anything that we're saying is, is beneficial for honeybees, it's ultimately going to be beneficial for the wild species too, because more often than not, we're really just talking about habitat. We're talking about providing wild, um, unmanaged or very little managed spaces where these organisms can have an opportunity to thrive on their own and especially to provide them with flowers, provide them with food. Um, so uh, for, for this presentation, I'm pretty much focusing on honeybees because um, we're pretty much focusing on honey. Um, so we're talking about a distinct species, but the importance of bees spans hundreds and hundreds of species, and we, we always take them into account when we're talking about bees in general. So with that, we'll move forward. Um, I, I have a bit of a PowerPoint presentation with a bunch of visuals. Again, my, my focus for the presentation is honey. I'm going to talk about the anatomy and physiology and behavior of the bees, but pretty much we're focusing through the context of how, how are they going out and getting nectar? How is it coming back to the hive? How are they turning it into the honey? And then what do we do with that? How does how do we get from nectar coming out of a flower to you buying a bottle of honey? Because um, that's the most common way that we all interact with the bees directly. Um, as usual with our classes, you can chime in in the chat with a question at any time. Um, and Alex will get my attention while I'm rambling on and 
and we can answer questions as we go. So let me see if I can get this screen share to work. Alex or somebody, can you tell me if that worked and see? Yep, you're good. We're good. We got the visual. Yep. All right. So, honey, um, let's start with the timeline because this always blows me away. The, the scope of the history of our planet is very humbling to try and comprehend. So we look way back into the timeline. According to the fossil record, the earliest flowering plants that we have found are over a hundred uh, million years ago. Uh, this number has been updated since I made this presentation. It's, it's closer to 150 or even more at this point. Um, there's some there's some more recently found fossils that are in contention of how old are they and can we classify them as an angiosperm or not. An angiosperm is the scientific word, the fancy word for a plant that produces a flower of some kind. The flower being the specialized sexual organ, specifically made by the plant for reproduction, producing pollen and the ovaries that will receive that pollen and turn into fruit and seeds for the next generation. So flowers, although they've changed significantly over time in form and shape, um, even function to some extent, they are they are very old constructions of plants. They've had a lot of time to tweak these designs. And for the vast majority of that time, they've been working with insects. We can see pretty early on, I mean, in, in the long scale timelines that we're looking at, pretty early on after flowers appeared, there appeared specialized insects working with them. And that's when I refer to the Apis genus. Apis is the genus of bees all over the world. Um, closely related to, or within, within the same family of wasps and ants and many other organisms, but Apis specifically is bees and all their forms that we identify them as today. And we, uh, a big key feature that we identify them as is that they are usually exclusively vegetarian and they are getting their food sources from flowers, from plants. Um, so they are a type of insect that at this point or even far back in their origins have adapted and evolved to specialize, to rely on flowering plants. Um, and so that is a big reason, the fact that this happened early on in their development is a big reason why they have such a tight bonded relationship. Um, this particular type of insect that is a pollinator everywhere that exists in the world. So, there, so the, the reason I put this up, not only to, to ogle at the, the immense scope of time that we can try and conceptualize of how long these things have been around, but also importantly to appreciate how long they've been around together. All right, so we have, we have millions of years worth of adaptation and evolution of plants, flowering plants, producing blooms to attract these now specialized pollinating insects and the, the push and pull between them that has shaped them into what they are and what we see them as today. So pollination and even particularly pollination with bees has, is an ancient practice on Earth. And now moving on, we move on to humans. Again, this, this number is contested depending on uh, you know, when, when we're looking back this far into fossil records, or as I have here, onto cave paintings and other early representations of humans, uh, none of these numbers are set in stone. Um, there's a lot of variation. But so roughly 200,000 years ago, we have the first documented cases of our species, Homo sapiens, existing on Earth. And uh, so in, in the scope of flowers and bees, we're, we're very new on the scene. Um, they've had a lot more time to interact with each other than we have. But we know that very early on, if not immediately, 
uh, in our human history, we were interacting with them. Um, this, this cave painting that I have depicted here came out of an excavation in Europe. There is debate as to what it depicts, but one of the most, uh, there's a lot of consensus around the idea that it depicts a human climbing up a tree and pulling honeycomb out of a hole in the tree. And so the, the, the things floating around the humanoid figure are supposed to be bees, um, you know, offended at the disruption of the hive. Uh, but so if whether that is the case or not, we have other accounts to show that uh, as far back as our early humanoid days of pure hunter gatherer society, that we knew about bees and we knew about uh, the golden beauty that is honey that they created and we were after it. And we can appreciate back uh, in that time, uh, this would have been a very challenging food to get. The, the time and energy and technique that it would have required humans to be able to find these hives in the first place, because they're not out in the open. Bees like to be protected. Um, in the wild, the most common place we would think of them is in like a hollowed out tree. So being able to have the ability to find a hive in the first place, follow some bees back to their hive, find it, and then be able to get in there somehow um, and rip out that comb and be able to take the precious honey within, packed with energy, particularly with sugar. Um, it would have been a very valuable resource. And so it, it makes sense that uh, we have been interacting with bees and we have been interested in bees and their honey for a very long time. Um, here are three pictures. These depict different ways um, that indigenous people would hunt and gather for honey. All of these practices still exist today in different parts of the world. On the far left, uh, this is taken uh, in the Amazon in Brazil. Um, this is a group of people who found a hive in a tree, completely cut the tree down, felled it down, opened it up. You have one individual pulling out honeycomb and with their bare hands, mushing it up and squeezing it. Um, looks like a young child with a bowl holding it out to catch all that honey as it dribbles out. And then once it's all mashed up and they've gotten all the honey they can, they have all this goopy wax left over and it would get chucked to the person on the right, the big plant leaf, just to collect the debris. Um, so not, not the cleanest way, but you definitely get a decent amount of honey out of it. Uh, in a similar fashion, on the top, on the right, uh, we have a man in Africa in a very similar situation. He found a wild hive in a tree has been able to use some type of tool to hack, cut a hole into the tree such that he can pull the comb, the wax comb of the hive out and harvest the honey that way. Um, and in the bottom, in the center, we have a more famous case of a man uh, in Southern Asia, um, usually around the Tibetan mountains, who is harvesting honey. This is a species of bees. It's actually not the Western. It's not Apis mellifera. It's a different bee that, uh, a different honeybee that exists in Asia. And they tend to grow their comb, as you see, open, but on cliff sides. So they're covered by the rain, but they're much more exposed than bees living in trees. Um, but there's a long tradition in that part of the world of people who will make makeshift ropes and And there's already people at the bottom ready to collect it and harvest the precious honey. Um, so there's there's cultures all over the world that have practices for finding and collecting honey from wild hives because we've been doing it for so long. Uh, jump ahead in our history, though. Again, like all of all of these examples, this still happens in the modern world. But somewhere along the line in human history, uh, we started coming up with different techniques that made it a lot easier for us to get a hold of the honey. Um, somebody, somebody along the lines, you know, had the idea, what, what if we didn't have to go out hunting for them every time? What if we could keep hives right by our house? Um, and that way, whenever we wanted honey, we could go rip it out and use some of it. And as with many other things, the, the, the earliest civilization or the earliest account of actual beekeeping instead of bee hunting that we have comes from ancient Egypt. Just over 4,000 years ago, we have actual hieroglyph records of Egyptians keeping bees. Uh, on the left-hand side here is depicted 
a beekeeper kneeling next to a stack of hives. For, for the ancient Egyptians, a hive was basically a, a cylindrical tube, uh, like a pot, except it was usually open on both ends or it might be closed on one end, so it was actually like a, like a ceramic pot of some kind. Um, and it would just be a hollowed out tube and by finding wild bees and trapping them in the tube long enough, you would basically try and entice them to start building out their wax in the tube and take up residence in there. And so they would have small hives living in the tube that you could stack to manage them. Um, the, the illustration, the, the recreation of hieroglyphs that you see on the right hand side there, it's a little fragmented, but basically starting on the left hand side, we see another stack of these tubular hives. And as you move across, reading from the left to the right, it depicts people taking those hives out and processing them, dumping the honeycomb into pods where it would then be churned up basically. Uh, they would have some very limited type of filtration process before at the far right end we see somebody actually wrapping up and probably using some of these wax as well to seal a container of honey. Um, and we, not, not only from the hieroglyphs do we know that the ancient Egyptians were beekeepers, we know it because there are several accounts at this point of tombs with mummies that have been unearthed and as they were usually buried with a great amount of artifacts, all of their riches, well many times they were buried with sealed pots and jars of honey. Um, so we have, bear, we have physical evidence of honey collected by Egyptians in ancient times. And so again, they, they were the first, but ever since then uh, that knowledge spread and uh, societies all over the world started coming up with different ways of, okay, how, how can we keep bees in a structure so that we can try and manage where they are and make it easier to get money from them? And that's led to a lot of different forms of hives. Mm -hmm. On the left-hand side here, we see something akin to what, what, we, what we think of the ancient Egyptians practicing. It's, it's, a, it's a tube, it's a cylinder of some kind, it's probably been made by hand or made on some type of pottery wheel and a small hive of bees was enticed to grow a little bit of comb in there. Um, on the far right hand side we see, uh, we, we know that again in the wild we most commonly find hives in hollowed out trees so why not accommodate them with a hollowed out tree. So on the far right we have a log that's been hollowed out, uh, a special roof has been made for it but they're allowing a hive to take up residence in there. In the middle, we have what's known as a skep, S-K-E-P. Um, in particular, throughout Europe for many generations, this was the most common and the most practical way to keep bees. It is basically a basket turned upside down. So the, the underside is completely open. And it, again, it's a basket, so it's hollowed out on the inside. And similar to the ceramic piece on the left, you would basically make this basket and you would capture wild hive, a wild hive, or maybe you were trying to transfer a hive that you've already had in some other structure. But you're basically capturing them in this basket, in this gap, and trying to entice them to stay. And if they start building out their wax on the top of that basket, then you know that you can have a hive, you can keep this gap around, the bees will come and go, they'll collect nectar, they'll make honey, and they'll store it in there. And so, for many generations, again, there's, there's lots of different shapes and forms to hives that took place. Um, but basically, we took the next step as keepers in terms of taking hives out of the wild, giving them a place to take up residence much closer to our homes uh, so that it was easier for us to get at the honey. The downside to all of these different uh, practices, whether you're just hunter gatherer, finding them in the wild and taking honey, or even if you're using any of these uh, very simply designed beehives. The problem is that in order to get honey, you have to destroy the hive. The bees build their wax comb directly off of these surfaces. There's no easy way to like slip them out one piece at a time. So if you wanted to go in and take that honey, whether by hand or using some other tool, you had to physically cut or tear that comb out and destroy it in the process. Um, especially, and then once you get it out, once you cut it out of the hive, you then literally have to tear it up and mash it up as much as possible to release all the honey. 
that you can then somehow filter out. Um, but so ultimately, you have to destroy the hive in order to collect the honey. And uh, for, for many generations, it was just the struggle of you would catch a wild hive, you would keep them there for the year. Uh, some, somewhere near the end of the year, once they've stored up a lot of honey, you would go in and you would destroy the hive. You would take all the honey and the bees would just disperse. They would either, uh, you know, hopefully be able to go off together and find a new place to make a wild hive again, or they might just die out. And then next year, if you wanted to keep bees again, you would go out, catch another wild hive and just store them for the year before at the end of the year, when you want to harvest, you have to destroy the hive again. Um, and so again, for, for many, many generations, that was the practice. People started to learn more and get some basic techniques of how like maybe, maybe we don't have to completely destroy the hive or maybe we can try and transfer the bees to a new hive before we go in and tear out all the honey. Uh, but, but nothing consistent. It was hard to actually maintain bees for longer than one season or a couple seasons even. And then very recently in our timeline, just over 150 years ago, we have one particular man in the UK, a reverend, um, who was tasked with running the apiary, the bee yard in the monastery that he lived at. And over time, basically out of practicality, he decided, you know, there's, there's got to be a better way to do this. There's got to be a better way where I don't destroy the hive in the process of getting the honey. And also just like, I want a way to be able to look in at the bees again without destroying the hive. And so he created the modern concept that we call the movable frames design, or it's now named after him, the Langstroth hive. Um, and you can, any, any pictures of modern beekeeping that you if not, this design exactly are inspired by this design, where whether it's a box or a long uh, chest of some kind, whatever the shape and size of the hive box itself, it has lips, it has little ledges that run out. And then you have these individual frames. You can see somebody in a suit pulling one of them out of the hive. Individual wooden frames that have little pegs on the end that stick out allowing that frame to sit on the ledges of the box. Excuse me. Um, and so we have multiple frames lined up just the way that the bees like to build them anyway, except instead of those frames being grown or, or built directly on and fused to the wood of the box, they're now contained within this rectangular wooden frame. And so I can pull one out and put it back in without actually damaging the comb. Um, people almost, people have described them in the past as pages in a book now, because, you know, if not only, not only when I'm harvesting, of course, if I'm harvesting the honey, it's easier now because I only have to take out the frames that have honey on them. I don't have to destroy the whole hive in the process. So I can just take the frames that I want out to process them to get honey and leave the rest of them in, I'm allowing the hive to remain. Um, but also, even when I'm not harvesting honey, even if I just want to inspect my bees, I can go through and like pages in the book, I can flip through, I can look at one frame, put it back, flip through a couple more, pull up another one, and the bees are no worse for wear. Um, so this was a huge innovation, a, a technology innovation in the world of beekeeping. And to this day around the world, it is the standard for keeping honey bees. This movable frame, the length of pie. Um, again, in, in this day and age, there's plenty of other uh, hive designs that take on different shapes and sizes, but for the most part, they all use this idea of individual frames that can sit suspended within the larger hive. And so they're just hanging there, and I can flip through them as I need. Um, again, the, the biggest thing about this is it allows us to keep bees without destroying the hive, uh, therefore allowing us to keep bees in perpetuity. Um, a good beekeeper with a really healthy hive that knows what they're doing, uh, understands the bees and knows how to read what's going on in the hive and see how the bees are reacting and can anticipate properly why they're reacting that way, um, is able to keep hives for many, many years. Um, and ultimately, a healthy hive is one that is going to want to expand. Um, so in the best case scenario, a beekeeper can manage the hive knowing that you're going to be able to literally split the bees in half and take some of the bees and put them in a new hive 
at a point in the future and be able to start a new hive that way. Um, so yeah, again, very, very, very recent in our timeline, but a huge innovation in the beekeeping world, movable frames. Um, and so because of that, that's opened up a whole world now of not only uh, being able to keep bees and sell honey much more profitably so that we have a consistent population of full-time beekeepers, not only in the U.S., but around the world, um, but it's also opened the gateway for a lot of research into understanding at a much deeper level, like how do the bees do what they do, trying to study the, the intelligence behind them, the very unique, you know, they, they are they are the organism from which we get the term the hive mind. And it is, it is truly amazing to study uh, the, the organizational structure of how, how do you get, how do you get uh, tens of thousands of individual organisms that have brains the size of sesame seeds, uh, but through working together and through consensus building and something very akin to a democratic process of voting one way or another on an issue, uh, they can make very complicated decisions as a hive to figure out, uh, should we be collecting more food? Where should we be collecting it from? Uh, do we need to raise more young? Do we need to raise a new queen? Is it time to split? Uh, when do we prepare for the winter, etc.? All kinds of complex decision making. Uh, it's very fascinating and it's ultimately led to uh, the very important mindset that because of this hive mentality that they have, um, pretty early on when you're learning to keep bees, you're, you're taught to appreciate the whole hive as the organism. Uh, when I go out to a hive, uh, most of my hives right now are probably averaging somewhere between 50 to 70,000 individual bees per hive. That's, that's healthy um, for the state that they're in right now. Um, but I don't go out to a hive looking at it as, all right, I have 50,000 plus individuals that I have to care for. Um, no, it's, it's one hive, and the hive is the organism. And in terms of me inspecting the organism and deciding when and why I need to intervene in some type of management practice, I'm looking at the hive as a whole. I'm not looking at individual bees. So let's talk about honey now, because that's what all the buzz is about, really. What is honey? So we know that the bees start with nectar from plants nectar that the plants have created uh, through photosynthesis primarily. The, when plants, the, the food that plants get out of photosynthesis is sugars. It's simple sugars. And they will definitely use a decent amount of that as energy for themselves. But flowering plants, angiosperms, at the time of year when they are blooming, they will take some of that sugar that they produce through photosynthesis, mix it with water, and put it in the nectaries of their flowers to entice uh, organisms to come and pollinate them. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a sacrifice from the plant, but it's, it's, a, it's a gamble that they know they're gonna win because everybody wants that sweet nectar. Um, so the bees start by going out and collecting nectar and it's just sugar water. It's a lot of water with a little bit of sugar, just enough to make it sweet, just enough to make it enticing. Um, and there's, there's a little bit more chemistry that we'll get into as we go through the process. But ultimately, honey, in the end, is also just this sugar water. So the simple answer is it's sugar water. It's a lot of water with a little bit of honey. But it gets a lot more complicated because in reality, depending on the plant, it's going to have a totally different profile of not just different sugars that are present in the nectar, but all kinds of different trace amounts of vitamins, minerals, other organic acids that the plant is producing. There's a whole array of organic compounds that exist in the nectar and ultimately exist in the honey. And it is for this reason that the bees can use the honey as a complete food. It's got everything that they need to survive in it. Um, for us, yes, you can read off this list and recognize a lot of things that are also essential for humans. Um, however, they are truly in trace amounts, or they exist in honey only in trace amounts. So you, you can't rely on going home and consuming large amounts of honey on a daily basis and think that you're going to get all the vitamins and minerals that you need. No. Um, 
we need to have a very varied diet. Uh, fortunately, as long as the bees are collecting nectar from a variety of different plant species, they're going to have the same variety of diet that we require and most organisms require. Um, and it's for this reason that honey is a complete food for them. Uh, so let's get a little more into the process now. So it starts what we're all familiar with, bees going out, finding flowers. Um, the, they do, there are, there are visual cues for the bees, of course. Um, bees have a different visual spectrum than humans and other organisms do, however, whereas, uh, you know, we, we know our visual spectrum is running between the colors that we define as red through violet, and then beyond that there's ultraviolet. We can't see that, but we know that it's there. We can measure it, uh, through different technological advances that we have. Well, through a lot of modern testing that has been done, it's been shown that bees have a very similar visual range as ours. It's about the same amount of colors, we'll say, that they can see, except it is shifted. So our visual range is red to violet. The bees is shifted over so that they can't see red, they can't see related colors like pink, but they can see past violet into ultraviolet. Um, so they have visual cues that we don't have. So while we can see lots of flowers and they can be colorful and big and beautiful and it seems so, uh, you know, it draws in your eye so well that it, it seems very logical. It's like, oh, of course, other organisms, pollinators are going to notice that and be drawn to it. Uh, yes, they are, but many times the actual visual cues, the, the colors and patterns that are attracting that insect, that pollinator, you can't see them. Um, they're all, they're in the ultraviolet spectrum and they're invisible to us. Um, so w w one example would be, I, I love, I love growing, uh, poppies in my garden every year. And, and I think of that all the time where I get all these beautiful pinks and reds and everything in between and they look so big and glorious and I see the bees love them and they're going through them all day long. But then I have to remind myself of like, I, I've never, I've never put a UV uh, light or a camera to it, but I, I wonder what the bees are seeing because they're not seeing the same color beauty that I am, but they're definitely being attracted. Uh, it's not just from the visual, they're being attracted by the smell. The most, uh, the most common way that bees communicate with each other and with the world around them is through smells and through pheromones. Um, and so, you know, you better believe that those flowers are pumping out all kinds of scents. Some flowers, especially ones that we have, we as humans have bred to the point that we have a very strong aroma. We can tell that. Um, but many, many species of flowers have a scent. It's weak. We can't smell it. It's not very strong, maybe unless you put your face right up to it. But you better believe that there are many organisms, including bees, that can really pick up on those trace amounts of scents being perfumed off of the flower. So they're attracted by that as well. Um, even as they forage from one flower to another, they're communicating with each other through scents. After a bee has gone to a specific flower and foraged it, especially if they know like they've drained that flower of all the nectar, it's probably not going to fill up with nectar again for several hours, if not the next 24 hours, they will produce a special pheromone and they'll secrete it or they'll leave it on the flower. And that smell communicates to other bees, hey, I was just here. There's no food here. And so sometimes if you watch a bee, in particular a honeybee, um, in a patch of flowers, you might find that they hover above several flowers before they pick one to land on. And many times the reason that they go by flowers, maybe hover over, hover over them and decide, no, I'm not going to go to this one, is because they're picking up that scent from somebody else that's telling them, don't waste your time. There's no nectar here. Go somewhere else. And so, again, there's visual cues, but in particular, there's multiple uh, smells or pheromone cues that the bees are using as they forage to find the right flowers. And they're sucking up that nectar from the nectaries. Depending on the design of the flower, uh, that nectar can be in very shallow pools right near the surface of the flower and they can really easily lap it up. Other times it's down a long tube or they have to go down into a chamber of the flower to get at the nectar. And like a lot of other bees, especially pollinators, they have evolved a very specialized tongue structure. We call it the proboscis, just like with butterflies. Um, you can see in this uh, 
zoomed in image here that there's there's some complexity to it, especially at the end where it looks uh, very fuzzy. Um, it's basically little little hair like structures that increase the surface area at the end of the proboscis, allowing it to very quickly soak up a lot more liquid faster. Um, this structure is actually in fact hollow, and so it's got the frilly end to very quickly draw in a lot of moisture, and then the bee can take its time sucking that up like a straw into its body. So it will it will absorb, not absorb it, it, it will ingest the nectar this way. And here we get a little cross section of the bee. And notice, so we've got we've got the, you can see the mouth of the bee, you can see the general um, throat of the bee as it goes down past the head. And as we get right to the back, to the abdomen, the largest part of the bee, you can see that there is a, a honey or golden colored structure known as the honey stomach. So the bee consumes this nectar. It runs down its throat. When it gets to the abdomen there, there is a split, there is a division. Going down one way leads to the stomach and the rest of the digestive system. Going the other way leads to the honey stomach. Um, any nectar that is stored in the honey stomach is not digested. It's basically just a storage unit. Um, inevitably, some uh, some different the, the bee's body will add certain chemicals, certain enzymes to the nectar while it's stored in the honey stomach. This will start to this is the first step in the process of producing honey because these enzymes, are, for the most part, are breaking down these sugars that the plant produces into even more simple forms of sugar. Uh, the more simple the form of sugar, the easier it will be to digest in the long run. Um, so these enzymes are converting the sugars present into uh, glucose and other simple sugars. But ultimately, what's most important is that this nectar is just being stored in the honey stomach. So a forager will go around, use their proboscis to suck up as much nectar as they can. When their honey stomach is full and they feel full and they know it, it's time to travel back to the hive. Now, they're working constantly, you know, busy as a bee, right? You don't want to waste any time. And so to be as efficient as possible, when one of these foragers comes back to the hive, she won't go in herself and find somewhere to put this nectar. She'll usually find someone close to the entrance of the hive and she'll communicate with them again through smell. Hey, I've got nectar. I'm ready to give it up. And once they say they're ready, she will regurgitate from her honey stomach all of that nectar. She'll throw it up. She'll transfer it to the mouth of her sister worker who is in the hive. They will swallow it. They'll ingest all of that nectar and store it in their honey stomach while they go deeper into the hive to find the right place to store it. This allows the forager to as quickly as possible empty her load of nectar and go right back out looking for more. You know, um, ideally, she found that nectar in a really good patch of flowers, you know, a, a really good source. And so the idea is she already knows where it is. So she's going to be super fast and efficient. If she can just come back to the hive, dump her load of nectar and go right back out. Meanwhile, her sister, who accepts that nectar from her, stores it into her honey stomach while she will crawl her way deeper into the hive and she'll find an appropriate place where they are storing nectar. She'll regurgitate it again into a cell, an individual cell. Um, whichever, whether she's starting a new one or whether she finds one that some other bees have already put a little bit of nectar in there, and she's just going to add more to keep filling it. Once these cells are full, um, as in like full almost to the brim, it's just a bunch of nectar still. Again, sugar water for the most part. We've got all the nutrients and the minerals in there, but for practical purposes, it's water with some sugar in it. The bees, at this point, once they know that the cells are full, they can't fit any more in, in this particular group of cells around them, they will expedite the evaporation of that water. They'll stand on top of the comb, these open cells of nectar, and they'll beat their wings really, really fast. They won't fly, but they'll just stand in place and beat their wings really fast. This will raise their body temperature, and this will cause an air current. And these two things expedite the evaporation of water out of that nectar. And they will continue this process until the water level keeps going down and then we have more sugar than we do water. We have a super saturated 
solution of sugar water. Um, the, the actual percentage is right around 19% water is what the bees are looking for. We don't totally understand yet uh, how the bees make this distinction. Um, it, it could be just from the smell. Maybe they're tasting it throughout to sample it and decide if it's, if it's right or not. Um, that's, that's, that's a forefront in bee research right now that I'm eager for somebody to find the answer to. Um, but ultimately, somehow we know that the bees have a process and they confidently know when it's yet that water content is right around 19% and we stop there. And that is honey. And so the primary thing that makes honey so thick and viscous and sticky is the fact that it's, it's ultimately sugar water, but it's more sugar than it is water. Um, this super saturated state is also what allows honey, in particular raw honey, to solidify over time. Anybody that's ever bought a uh, fresh local or raw honey from a store, um, and you know, even if when you bought it, it was liquid, over time it became solid, it crystallized. That is the sugar molecules in suspension uh, over time bonding together and forming crystals because there's not enough water to keep them mixed up. There's not enough water to keep them in a liquid state. So they'll just start forming crystals as they naturally do. And over time, you can have a jar of honey that's totally solid. Fortunately, all you have to do is heat it up in some hot water again, and it'll reliquify. Um, but the, the reason that honey will solidify like that is because it is this super saturated sugar solution. Um, and so again, we, we get the bees get it to 19% water, and that is honey at that point. And from there, they will cap it. They will seal whatever individual cells that they have completed this process with. They'll seal it, and that is finished honey. The bees are storing that for winter. And this is the big important key that we need to get to now. Of why do the bees make honey? Yes, it's their food. Yes, it's a complete food. But in fact, throughout most of the year, um, the bees aren't eating this honey. They're eating a little bit here and there. Lots of times they're eating nectar before it turns into honey. Uh, it's honey and or nectar that's getting mixed with pollen and other materials. But the primary reason that the bees make honey is as a winter survival strategy. The bees know that winter is going to come and not only is it going to get cold enough that they can't go outside, but there's no flowers outside anyway. There's no source of food over the winter. And we have so, a question, Taylor. Yeah. How long does this process take? The the process of nectar to honey? Yeah. Um, it definitely depends on the population size of the hive. If they have enough foragers, enough workers to expedite this process as quickly as possible. Um, but it's it's happening on a daily basis. Um, the the fastest that so I. So a single frame, I don't, I don't have a frame with me, but a single wooden frame of honeycomb. And that's comb that's built out where it's comb on both sides. Um, if the bees fill that entire frame with honey, that is approximately five pounds of honey. The fastest I have ever seen bees fill an entire frame front and back is two weeks. Um, I'm sure there's people that have seen it happen faster than that. Um, a lot of that depends not just on the health and the population size of the hive, but also on the environment around them. Um, when, we're, when we're talking about supporting the health of honeybees and all of our native bees, we always emphasize the importance of there always being flowers for them. It's, it's not enough to have, you know, one really big patch of sunflowers and you know, they look beautiful and the bees enjoy them while they're there, but any individual sunflower plant or any individual, any other kind of plant isn't going to bloom all year long. Um, so it's important that we make sure there is always something in bloom for them. Um, my point in bringing that up is that depending on the time of year, there might be a large abundance of nectar or there might be not that much out there. Um, when there is a large abundance of nectar, when there are a lot of flowers blooming, um, beekeepers refer to that period in time as a flow, as a nectar flow. And so depending on what region of the country or the world that you were in, you tend to learn when the major flows are. 
uh, throughout the year. In, in here in Frederick, Maryland, in, in our region of Maryland, we have two big flows. Um, we can't always depend on them, especially like if there's a year with a very uh, prolonged or intense drought, basically less water availability to plants means that those plants have less water that they can sacrifice or give up to make nectar with. Um, so if, if we have a good year, like this year actually, where um, spring wasn't too cold and we had a decent amount of rain, so there was always moisture, and there have always been plants, you know, it's been pretty dry right now, but it's the time of year in summer when we expect that anyway. Hopefully coming into the fall, we'll get some more moisture. Um, but so anyway, the two flows that we have in our area is early to mid spring, we have the black locust trees blooming here. Anybody that's familiar with those, and here in Frederick County, they're all over the place, but they're gorgeous. It's a, it's a native tree that produces flowers that hang like uh, groups of grapes. They hang in clusters and they're these pea-like, gorgeous white flowers. And so they make these big, uh, very noticeable clusters of flowers. Um, in the right, we have enough of those trees around that in the right year, and there's been enough moisture, they can produce a ton of nectar on their own, regardless of other things that are blooming in the area. And so in a good enough year, the bees can take in, in the, in the like two, two and a half week period that the black locust is blooming, they can pack in tens and tens of pounds of nectar and within a couple of weeks, convert all of it to honey. Um, in those situations, if you, as a beekeeper, are paying attention and time it right, you can even harvest that and sell it as a varietal honey, as black locust honey. Um, a varietal in general means that up to 80% or a minimum 80% of the nectar in that honey came from a single species or a single type of flower source. Um, that can be hard to achieve and that can be hard to prove. So varietal honey tend to be more valuable. Um, but so anyway, during a flow, Question. like, yeah. Oh, do the bees work all day, even nighttime, making this process happen? Um, there is a little bit of work. There's definitely some work within the hive over the nighttime because even during the day, the hive is pitch black. There might be a little light coming in the entrance. Um, but there, there's not a lot of openings. The, the bees can handle working in the dark. Again, most of their communication with each other is through smell. Um, so it's not as important. They cannot forage during the night. Uh, bees, one of their primary ways that they orient themselves is with the sun. Um, we as humans and other organisms, we have different methods. Of course, we have our visual, but we also have things, you know, like um, specialized bones or collections of water in our skull that you know when we turn um, your nerves register that you're turning and that's why it feels uncomfortable when you're upside down and your brain is telling you like something's not right you're upside down um, the bees primary way that they have that sense of up from down is the sun so when the sun goes down uh, it's not just that they're blind because there's no light but their sense of up down right left is is all screwed up so um, in terms of foraging, going out and finding nectar, there's none of that going on at night. However, there's, al there's always some work being done in the hive, uh, even during the night. However, bees also do do a bit of resting. Resting for a bee, it's, it's not sleep or anything like that we could relate to. It's basically just standing in place and not exerting as much energy for a certain period of time. Uh, and usually it doesn't last long because they'll pick up a chemical signal from somebody that's giving them a task to do, and then off they go to do that task. Um, so yeah, it, they can they can store up and create this honey very quickly, depending on the time of year, especially if there's a nectar flow going on. Um, the other flow that we have in our region is coming up uh, later this fall. It's the goldenrod flow, and so I'm I'm hoping that there's a lot there's a lot of blossoms, there's a lot of nectar, and they'll be able to very quickly put on a lot more nectar and turn it into honey before winter comes because again they're making honey for the winter and as they survive over the winter honey is going to be their only source of food so they need it and they need a lot of it they need enough for hundreds if not thousands of bees to survive over the winter and the primary way that they do that is they're just huddling together 
they're forming a ball in the hive and they're just huddling together using their body heat for warmth and they will as a ball slowly move throughout the hive consuming honey as they find it um, and hopefully ideally healthy hives produce more honey than they need such that come next spring when it's warming up and uh, plants are beginning to flower again and there's new sources of food and nectar out in the world that the bees have not exhausted the honey that's in their hive. Maybe they have a little bit left over, but now they don't need it because there's a new fresh source and they can go out. Um, so it's always important to try and make sure that your bees have enough resources throughout the year so that they can produce enough honey to survive through the winter. Um, this is a crucial process that beekeepers have to appreciate because you have to appreciate any amount of honey that you take from a hive is honey that they're not going to have over the winter. And so if you're not paying close enough attention, if you're being too greedy and you take too much honey, you can kill your hive. You can cause them to starve throughout the winter. So as a beekeeper, you want to get a share of the honey that they're making, but you have to try and ascertain how much you can safely take without starving the hive. Um, there, are all there are all different kinds of ways that beekeepers do this. Um, most of the time, um, through your own experience, you'll just, have, you'll just have an understanding of, okay, this hive is approximately this big. That means they'll need approximately X number of pounds of honey to make it through the winter. And then you can assess, you know, well, they currently have twice as much honey as I think they need to survive the winter. So if I take half, they should be okay. So beekeepers will make an assessment, take whatever percentage of honey they think is safe in order to keep the bees alive. Uh, some beekeepers will then just let them go with that. and Hopefully that's enough for them. Others will try and feed them over the winter. Um, honey, because it is super saturated, because it's more sugar than it is water, it will not freeze. And so that is a big, you know, that's a huge evolutionary perk for the bees in their process. And that's why they can rely on consuming honey throughout the winter. Um, however, a common way in the warm times that people will feed their bees if necessary is they'll just give them sugar water. But you can't give them sugar water in the winter because it'll freeze and it's useless to the bees if it's frozen. Uh, so the most common way that if people deem it necessary, they will feed their bees in the winter is they will either buy or make baker spawn on. Um, you know, the, the, the thick icing like material. You just make it in big sheets. You can literally lay it on top of all the cones on the top of the hive and let the bees eat it throughout the year. Um, another method, the, the method that we practice here at Fox Haven, um, you know, we're fortunate enough that we keep the bees for their pollination services and just for education purposes as much as for honey sales. Um, we're not, we're not full-time beekeepers, so we don't have to rely on making sure we get X number of pounds of honey every single year. Um, so the way that we do it is we will let the bees go throughout the year. They'll collect and produce all the honey that they can, and we will leave it all to them. And so they'll have everything that they produce to get through the winter. And hopefully it's enough. If it's not enough, you know, we'll try and feed them or we'll deem like, why, why were they not able to produce enough? Is it because of disease or some other issue or was it just a hard year for them? And we can supplement some feed to help them along. Whatever the case, we want to leave them as much honey as we can because that is their ideal food. We could feed them something like baker spawn down, but that's basically like empty calories just to give them enough energy to stay alive. It doesn't have the rich nutrition that honey has. So we want them to have as much honey as possible. We let them keep that all throughout the winter. And then first thing in the spring, when we have new flowers and the bees have a new fresh source of food out in the world, then we'll go in and we'll take whatever honey is left over in the winter that they're not going to use at this point. So in the long run, it means that we end up harvesting a lot less than we potentially could. Um, but it's 